This organisation and all the sponsors are now the powerhouse in Australian agriculture that's investing in innovation and change and, more important, human capacity building. It's a credit to all the scholars and investors who continue to make this organisation contribute so much to Australian agriculture. I'm Michael Hastings and I was extremely fortunate to become an Uffield Scholar in 2005. I was invited to present in this session titled Where Are They Now? And of course the conference titled Produce Change. There's one thing in life that is certain and that is change. And the best change is usually the one that as organisations and individuals that we plan for or fac facilitate. I felt that in order to have a look at this, it was important to have a look at where we started. So my background was that I grew up on a very small farm of only 175 hectares in southwest Victoria. The farm was simply not viable or profitable and was struggling. However, my passion was in farming and agriculture. Get a career off farm, they said. Go and get a degree, they said. Go and do something different, they said. And many of my peers did precisely that. After leaving school, I headed off to the University of New England in Armidale, living at Robb College, doing a degree in rural science. Then later to that, I added business management. At this stage, I thought that I may end up potentially as an extension officer in the Department of Primary Industry, but was constantly looking for options that could potentially boost the farm viability. I spent my holidays working on different enterprises, such as hydroponics, stud cattle, coffee, llamas, game farms, and traditional farming enterprises. I also had the opportunity to work at Krana Crocodile Farm up at Rocky, where the tourism trade actually built and developed the farming business. On the crock farm, as you can see, I learnt the meaning of don't bite the hand that feeds you or else you're stuffed. <laughs> Ostrich also caught my eye as the industry was in its infancy and set to go through a breeding and boom phase. I thought that this may be the ticket to high profits and the potential to capitalisation and expansion of the, of the farm, allowing me to follow my passion back into broad acre ag agriculture. In addition, I was faced with the daunting task of selecting my honours thesis topic, and not much was known about ostrich, and most of the information was guarded by the South African industry who at that time had a monopoly on the world market and a single desk marketing cooperative to assist in that positioning. The South African farmers were making a great living as commercial ostrich farmers. I was also not too keen on being the 40th honours student to study a topic such as the effect of bypass protein sources on the fibre diameter of sheep and hence having to wade through massive quantities of work in order to find a minor point of difference. I also figured that a new topic with no information or experts could be in my favour because both would be interesting and also bloody hard for them to mark. So, ostrich it was. It also allowed me to ask the question, was this the tool that I needed to produce change of the farm to allow me to make it profitable? The ostrich, a unique creature. The ostrich, they have eyeballs bigger than their brain. They have a memory shorter than a goldfish. They have no survival or self-preservation skills. They simply want to get to the promised land as quickly as possible. <laughs> However, they're an avian herbivore that's quite unique and very closely related to dinosaurs. And it still intrigues me every day how they avoided extinction. 
Ostrich, however, didn't require much land. The South African farmers were very profitable, so I thought it was worth a shot to make the farm viable and hopefully fund the expansion of the beef enterprise and farms. So I got a little bit excited at this rapid growth and at that stage stock were increasing by $1,000 a month of age. So I went out and borrowed $36,000 and purchased six three-month-old ostrich chicks. I also convinced my parents to go out on a limb and also buy a couple. It was good to keep them in the fold. So this was the start of Hastings Ostrich Farms in 1989. So thesis done, I became an author according to the tax office as in order to get the information out to industry I turned it off to the university press and published my thesis as a book. I was always out looking for a bit of pocket money. This was much to the disbelief and astonishment of my school English teacher. <laughs> so with a new enterprise, I was able to start rebuilding the farm. Plan A was to make a fortune and fund my entry into broad acre agriculture. Plan B, was to fund the development of the ostrich farm and infrastructure during the breeder phase and then hopefully settle down to commercial production. At this stage, I didn't have a plan C. To increase our scale, we share farm stock with other investors and farmers as we had the knowledge, but we didn't have the capital. At this stage, breeding pairs were already selling at forty to $60,000 a pair. Share farming was prevalent throughout Australia and caught the eye of ASIC as a potential MIS. So I became a guinea pig and presented a test case on behalf of the industry in obtaining the first exemption from the law of offering a prescribed interest. This was an interesting exercise. The industry built up numbers and we started contract incubation services and expanded from my original little 30 egg incubator to a 2,000 egg hatchery. Prices started to correct, so we changed from share farming to the adjustment of stock. Then, in 1997, we saw commercialisation and rationalisation of the industry. Unfortunately for the Australian ostrich industry, this happened to coincide with the overproduction of stock, resulting from the deregulation of the South African industry in 1990. Everyone was trying to sell to the same markets that the South African industry had trained up to expect only 150,000 birds per annum. This was quite serious stuff, because all, all of a sudden the birds were practically worthless, and it was also a period of time that Victoria and I had also started our own breeding program and started nesting. So we could either make like an ostrich or produce change. So we had to look at options. It was time to put the farming operation into holding pattern. Following this, I spent a three year period of time lecturing at Marcus Oldham College, where I discovered a passion for ad adult education and human capacity building. Here I mainly lectured in marketing and animal production and was charged with the task to rewrite the marketing curriculum to lift the students from advanced diploma to degree level. It was a great time to consider the next phase of our farm and also to observe some of the students develop marketing plans and build great businesses. One of those was the, the founders of Boundary Bend, Olive, Boundary Bend Olives. We had a period of live exports, followed by genetic sales to assist our cash flows. Writing and comp complying with a multitude of protocols and developing a live export business was a new challenge, but it was a necessity to in, in enable us to cash flow the business. 
Also, the investment into an exotic tannery business of ostrich, emu, crocodile, barramundi, and kangaroo. This resulted from the South Africans sending out to Australia all their agents in order to stitch up as much product as possible in an attempt to control our industry. We will look after you, they said. Send your skins to us, they said. You don't have the te technology in Australia to tan, ostrich, they said. Your birds are inferior to ours, they said. Leave the industry, they said. So, produce change, we said. So we headed off and we stole a master tanner out of Zimbabwe. And we found that our skins were equally as good as theirs. So the tannery was an interesting and eventful education of a producer-owned value-added uh, company. At the peak of the industry, the Australian industry, we had 3,000 farmers processing 20,000 birds. With rationalisation, Hastings Ostrich Farms took over and tried to preserve as many of the best genetic lines of stock in Australia, which had been imported during the boom phase. And we became a bulk supplier of day-old chicks to other, other farmers. At our peak in 2003, we put 14,000 eggs through the hatchery and it had been quite a roller coaster ride of market development. To add to the roller coaster ride, we had market access issues. In 1998 and 2002, caused by Newcastle's disease, outbreaks in the poultry industry, shutting down our exports. So we went out and we wrote the Australian Ratite on farm surveillance plan. This allowed us to compartmentalise our farms and operate them effectively as their own country for export in the event of another Newcastle's outbreak. So following that, things weren't looking too bad. <coughs> the, we had an integrated production system we had some great breeding stock, had an export hatchery, producing plenty of day-old chicks, rearing and grow-out facilities. And all of our stock were fully performance recorded, allowing full traceability and improvement of our genetic program. So it was time to have a look, where to now? So with the encouragement of the late Henry Hopkins, I applied for a Nuffield scholarship. It took a year to get the business ready. Upon returning, they said, nothing will be the same, they said. You'll not be needed in your business, they said. Go out and see the world, they said. So it was an incredible journey, looking at supply chains in supermarkets and the trends in the UK and also all over the world with other opportunities of retail outlets. Yes, the Nuffield journey was life-changing and definitely confidence-boosting. A few of the observations. In South Africa, the ostrich industry was segmented, had lots of politics due to, due to its existence for well over 100 years. Internal competition between groups for market share, and a main focus on EU for meat and Japan for skins. Skins were competing in the top end of town in the luxury goods market, and the meat was predominantly competing against other game meats in the EU, such as wild boar, springbok, and venison. When visiting, I was constantly told and reminded. Ostrich are stupid. The only thing sillier than an ostrich is an ostrich farmer. <laughs> Going on to look at some of the supermarkets, I found it quite intriguing 
in the foyers to see benchmarking based on the cheapest shopping trolley. Supermarkets had the core culture of trying to be market leaders by being, having the cheapest offering, using supply chain managers to initially reduce inefficiencies, but later on pushing more risk and pressure onto producers, pushing consumers into more profitable home brands where the source of the goods had lost identity. Once inefficiencies were extracted out of the supply chain, often then looking at importing other commodities from other countries with either a lower cost base or a weaker currency. Although some producers, particularly ones with scale, were doing extremely well through this supply chain, there were also other significant opportunities and others making great profits by breaking outside these channels through effective niche marketing, branding, positioning of products into other market outlets. Some of these were through direct sales, farmers markets and farm shops. My travels allowed me to have a good look at the different structures in a number of different countries, which was a great opportunity to see the similarities. One product was a bit of a light bulb moment, was the humble potato. It really caught my attention amongst all the other products I looked at. It was being sold from Nova Scotia, well above any previous price ceilings into Walmart, but also accompanied full cooking instructions. So I figured if you could brand a potato, you could brand anything. <coughs> a definite highlight of the Nuffield program was actually being able to take the family along. So it was great for Victoria Thomas and Charlotte to be able to join me for a quick stint in South Africa to actually become part of the Nuffield experience. As sometimes it's forgotten that they have to carry the burden of all the business during the travels. I pulled out um, one of my slides from my original Nuffield presentation just to, just to have a quick flick back through of what the couple of the findings were. A couple of the, the results that I'd looked at in order to achieve more stable returns was simply don't meet your competitors head on where they likely have a competitive advantage. The progressive producers will need to be involved in some form up the chain or become better marketers of their produce, produce and maintain long term consistent returns. And that the stability of returns generally improves the further you go up the supply chain. Upon returning, I was faced with a lot of different challenges. My tannery partners had decided they wanted to retire in my absence. I faced a drought with record feed prices and also my parents had decided that they were going to retire at the end of the financial year. So where are we now? Well, I've got some great cattle. We've got an, an Angus herd and um, we've got the foundation of a Speckled Park stud, which we believe the breed will provide marbling of beef off grass at a younger age. We have more involvement throughout the whole value chain, so a lot more involvement outside the farm gate, so we're now involved in trucking processing our stock, uh, the skins, tanning, manufacturing, and also a farm shop. Interestingly enough, as I drove out to the airport on my first Nuffield trip, I saw that the National Australia Bank in town was for sale. I rang them up on the way to the airport, however they informed me that it had already been sold. When I returned, it still was for sale. The sale had fallen through, so we bought our first bank that we imp implemented that were extremely important 
is that we develop very significant post farm gate relationships. This was absolutely critical in, in maintaining effective communication back to the farm and being able to negotiate pricing effectively. We focused on meat markets that, um, that South Africa could not access. So South Africa often would go and use discounting methods to win sales. And the reality, reality is that a lot of international competitiveness isn't necessarily related to our efficiencies, it's related to the value of our currency. We simply couldn't compete with South African rand. Ostrich was being marketed as a game meat, whereas I could remove myself out of those markets into markets that South Africa couldn't touch, such as the US, Canada and Japan, and sell it in a market that was perceived as a healthy red meat. We removed as many intermediaries as possible to provide effective communication with the customer of the volumes of product we'd have for six to 12 months out, and also the prices that we needed to achieve in order to stay profitable. We pushed meat prices um, so that we could maintain our product, and we made meat the, the core product from the bird, whereas previously it had been leather, which had been highly volatile under the luxury market. Lately, this has been assisted by the Australian Single Desk Marketing Authority. That's my office. We diversified our product as much as possible within the industry. We maintained agritourism arm ticking along with group tours and buses so that they can be organised in advance and around the general farming activities, allowing a two to two and a half hour turnaround in groups, including delivering them into the farm shop. We've maintained markets and opportunities for live exports and the sale of genetics. And we've maintained value-added products through the farm shop. Where are we now? Well, we're an endangered species. Last commercial ostrich farm in Australia. We're having to maintain a wide range of skills. As the last person standing, you end up being the person having to do all government liaison, market maintenance, biosecurity plans, protocol developments, residue testing, all export logistics, customer maintenance and relationships including all the pre-farm gate activities. So it can be a little bit um, busy at times. However, we've got great niche markets. However, it's a time to produce change. So we, we have also come to the conclusion that we need to look at restructuring the business in order to ensure that the ostrich industry is maintained in Australia. So it's a time to look for opportunities and see what the next chapter will bring. A time to produce change. Thank you very much.